Okay, in this session we're looking at um, if physicalism won't work, what are the alternatives? And as you know, we haven't shown that physicalism won't work, but we've shown that every attempt to be a physicalist has problems, not only problems, but serious problems. Um, so let, let's have a look at what we ought to do if physicalism won't work. Um, We've seen that reductive physicalism, identity theory, is probably false. Um, if you remember, that was Kripke's argument, which suggests that um, if mental states and physical states have entirely different properties, how could they be the very same thing? How could they be numerically identical? Then we looked at non-reductive physicalism. We looked at two types of non-reductive physicalism, functionalism and anomalous monism. Uh, and we saw that both of them face serious difficulties. Can anyone tell me what the problem was with functionalism? In a sentence? OK, what was... What, no what? No qualia. That's not quite a sentence. Could you, could you manage to put that into a sentence? It wasn't a sentence. You didn't believe it. Uh, no, that's true. It fails to explain experience. Um, in, it fails to explain experience, but in what way does it fail to explain? What, do you remember talking about the gap? What was the gap um, that looked as if it might scupper functionalism? Too much wine, that's a... Sort of ex the gap between external behaviour and uh, internal feelings. Feelings, yes, OK. So the idea was that if you can produce a robot that behaves exactly as we do, um, the functionalists would have to say that that robot experiences the world as we do. Well, OK, you might believe that, but if you think that there's the possibility of a gap here, that you might get a robot that behaves exactly as we do but doesn't experience the world as we do, then that's a problem for functionalism. So um, that's functionalism. What about anomalous monism? What's the serious difficulty for anomalous monism? Can anyone tell me? It leads to epiphenomenalism. Uh, it leads to epiphenomenalism. What do you mean by that, Frank? Uh, it's doesn't leave anything for the mental to do if the physical is doing e everything. So it appears, perhaps, according to Kim, though he's wrong, <laughs> we won't have any gloss on, one. on top of the. Uh, okay. So the worry about anomalous monism is if the mental states have physical properties and sorry, if causally efficacious states have both mental properties and physical properties. If it's the physical property that's lawfully related to the behaviour, then in what sense does the mental have any work left to do? That's the problem for anomalous monism. Um, so we saw that neither of those problems are conclusive. Uh, functionalism can maybe come back from the problem of the gap, uh, but maybe when it comes back from the problem of the gap, it, it does so by having to say that qualia don't exist at all. And, and that's difficult. Um, and we can see that anomalous monism can come back on the causal exclusion argument. But in order to do so, it has to say that causation is something very different from what we usually think it is. And that's the argument I didn't have time to go in for and it, into, and therefore we'll need to talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Um, but the fact is that both those um, theories of the mind can come back on the problems that were facing them. But whether they can come back sufficiently and in a way that's convincing is very much open to question. So we haven't shown that physicalism is false, but we have shown that it faces serious problems. OK, um, so what we're going to do is take those serious problems at face value just for the moment and say, well, OK, if we've shown that, that reductive physicalism and non-reductive physicalism are facing difficulties that actually it's really quite difficult to see how people are going to get over those difficulties, what is the alternative? 
what, what do we do if we're not physicalists about the mental? And one possibility is that we should simply accept that mental states exist, but that they're not physical and that they're not causally efficacious. Okay, that's one thing that we might do. Another thing we might do is just say, well, mental states, let's get rid of them. What, what do we need them for? We, we don't need them in our ontology at all. Remember what an ontology is? It's your list of what exists. And so if you say that ghosts don't exist, ghosts are not on your ontology, and if you eliminate mental states from your ontology, then what you're saying is that mental states don't exist either. Okay, and in this session, what we're going to do is look at both these possibilities in the order given. So we're going to look at epiphenomenalism. Oh, I only just managed that one, didn't I? And then we're going to look at eliminativism. Okay, epiphenomenalism is the view that mental states exist, but they're not physical and they're not causally efficacious. And you see why these two things go together, if you remember from earlier on. The biggest problem for a dualist is the question of causality. So long as we adhere to the view that the physics is causally closed, do you remember what physics is causally closed means? It means that any state that causally interacts with a physical state must be itself physical. And so if mental states interact with physical states, they must be physical in some sense. So if mental states are not physical, and that's what we looked at both by looking at dualism and at looking at the problems for reductive and non-reductive physicalism, uh, it means that mental states just can't causally interact with physical states. <laughs> and that's hugely counterintuitive. You think that I pick up this glass because I want a glass of water, I want a drink of water, and I believe that by doing this, I will get a glass of water. Um, but actually, if mentally states are not, sorry, mental states are not causally efficacious, then the explanation must, my behaviour must be other than that. It can't be that my belief and my desire are caus causally efficacious. Okay, this is usually deemed a problem, as we saw when we looked briefly at Cartesian dualism, but the epiphenomenalists don't see it as a problem at all. <laughs> Um, the epiphenomenalists have three arguments for the view that mental states are not physical states. Okay, there's the knowledge argument, the modal argument, and the what is it like to be argument. So let's look at each of these in turn. Okay, so this is, this is an argument for the view that mental states are not physical. So, so far, what, what we've looked at is arguments for the view that mental states are physical, and then we've looked at problems for that view. But now we're looking for a positive argument for the claim that mental states are not physical. OK, um, let's look at the knowledge argument. The knowledge argument, Mary, a scientist who knows all there is to know about the physical world. So, for example, she knows that um, people who claim to experience red have been looking at an object that reflects light at 650, I'm told, nanometers. Um, OK. But Mary, since birth, has been living in a monochrome world. Um, she, doesn't, she has never experienced red. She's never seen a tomato. She's never seen a pillar box. She's never seen Susie's lovely coat, etc. cetera. Um, she, all she's ever seen is black and white. But she knows all there is to know about colour vision, and she knows all there is to know about what causes colour vision, um, what causes somebody to say that they see something as red and so on. But she's never actually experienced red. And the epiphenomenalist will claim that um, when she comes out of her room and bumps into Susie, she thinks, wow, that's what they mean when they say they experience red. Wow, this is different. And the thought is that she acquires knowledge that's new to her. But, the thought goes, the knowledge that she acquires is not physical. She already knew that objects reflect light at 650 nanometers. She already knew 
that human beings say that object is red when the object reflects light in that way and so on. She knew all that. What she didn't know was what it is to experience redness. And the thought is that what she's learnt is not something physical. Therefore, it can't be the case that all information is information about the physical world. It can't be the case that everything you could know is knowledge about the physical. Why wasn't the physical experience seeing the red jacket? Why? It would have involved a physical experience. I mean, she, she would have known that when she experienced red, your jacket was reflecting light at 650 nanometers, and she would have known that when she, um, when the the reflected light hit her, that she was experienced, that she was this and that and the other was happening in her brain. But what she had never experienced before is what it felt like to see red. But she's experiencing it now. Now she's experiencing it. Now she can see what other people are talking about when they mean they see red. But I don't understand why it's not physical knowledge. Um, because she had all the physical knowledge before. So the knowledge she's learnt now is what it feels like to experience red. That's the only knowledge she didn't have before. She had only ever experienced black and white before. Do you see? No, I don't think you do. OK, sorry, I can see that there are lots of people dying to come in. Susie. OK, well, Leo. Couldn't you argue that if she knows all that there is to know about the physical world, an automatic spin-off of that is that she's going to... She knows what it's like to experience red. If, if you think that, you would have to think that the experience of red is a physical thing. And actually, we don't usually... Do you remember when we asked for people's intuitions? And, and I haven't got the flip chart here, but we, we put qualia on the side of the mental rather than on the side of the physical. You don't have to say why she why she has to think it no she doesn't think it's a physical thing she she believes that she's learnt something that she uh, didn't uh, know before the, the gentleman back there is saying she knows everything there is to know about the physical world why can she not infer from that the experience of seeing red okay well the, if you're going to say that what you need to be able to say is that you can somehow infer from the nothing other than the physical data what it is to experience red. Um, I don't see how you could infer that. I think you could know a lot about um, re light objects reflecting light. I think you could know a lot about the human visual system without knowing what it's like to experience red. The point is that um, this is Jackson's example, isn't it? Yeah. Mary. Uh, Jackson has to know that Mary cannot work that out. And he doesn't... No, he doesn't have to know that because he's postulating that. This is a hypothesis. Yeah, no, you, you can reject the hypothesis. Of course you can. You can say, actually, if Mary had all the physical understanding, she would also know what it's like to experience red. Um, I suppose, as usual, you get out what you put in. But the reason you might think that it's not the case, because can you imagine knowing about nanometers, knowing about light reflecting from objects, knowing about the human visual system, etc., and being blind? I mean, could a blind person know everything about the human visual system that would explain why somebody claimed to see red? I mean, a, a blind person... And here's other people say the tomato's red. OK, he may not know what it's like to look to see red, but he knows what someone means when they say that, in the sense that he knows that this is a property they're ascribing to an object, etc. I don't see why Mary couldn't be perhaps a blind person who knows a lot about the human visual system, a lot about how light is reflected from objects, etc., and impacts on the human visual system, but doesn't know what it's like to experience red. If you think there is a gap between what she could know physically and what she could experience, then you're thinking the experience is something that is over and above the physical. That's what the epiphenomenalists say on this argument. 
I can see lots of questions. I'm going to allow them if they're very quick, and I'm going to interrupt you if they're not. Frank. I think it's Lewis, in fact, arguing against this, who gives a lovely example of Marmite, isn't it? And saying, you, you can't possibly know what Marmite is like until you've tasted it, which is <laughs> the same as Jack's. It would be the same. I mean, you could know what the ingredients of Marmite like, were like, etc., and what people say when they eat up Marmite, but you couldn't know what it was like until you'd actually experienced it. Yep. Chris. Physicists know quite a lot about what it's like to travel near the speed of light, but I can guarantee nobody's ever experienced it. <laughs> so you're saying there is a gap between physical knowledge and experience. OK, well, if you're an epiphenomenalist, you believe that this argument is an argument for saying that there's a gap between knowing things about the physical world, knowing about colour experience from a physical point of view, and knowing about colour experience from the point of view of one who actually experiences it. Um, the second argument, um, we considered earlier the possibility that there might be a robot who's physically identical to and behaves exactly like you, but who lacks consciousness. Well, the epiphenomenalists say, if you really think there could be such a world, a really could be a robot who is exactly like you, but who lacks consciousness, then again, you believe that everything physical about this world can be duplicated without the mental being duplicated. In other words, you can have a molecule for molecule doppelganger of Alan, um, and yet not produce, sorry, physical doppelganger of Ar Alan, without producing his mental states. And if you think that, says the epiphenomenalist, then you're saying that the, the mental is not physical. Um, preserve, if preserving the physical isn't enough to preserve the mental, then the mental can't be physical. It must be something over and above the physical. Genesis, that would be a good thing if you could do what you suggested. <laughs> <laughs> what, produce exactly him, but without the... <laughs> That's his wife, by the way. <laughs> OK, and then finally, there's the what it is like to be argument. Um, we know, may know everything physical there is to know about bats, says the epiphenomenalist, but we still don't know what it's like to be a bat. Uh, indeed, actually, we could know everything physical there is to know about you, but still without knowing what it's like to be you. I mean, for each of us here, there's, there's a peculiar something, Tom Fisher. There's something it's like to be Tom Fisher, but I don't know exactly what that is. No matter how often I've talked to Tom and da-da-da-da, I still do not see the world through his eyes. I don't know what it's like to be him. And again, the epiphenomenalist says that to the extent that there's something it's like to be something that falls outside the physical facts about that thing. So I could learn everything physical there is to know about Tom, and I still wouldn't know what it's like to be Tom. Um, that something it is to be like isn't physical. OK, so according to the epiphenomenalist, even when all the physical information is in, we still won't know about the awfulness of pains, the itchiness of itches, the pang of jealousy, etc. Um, so the epiphenomenalist thinks the mental is real and he thinks it isn't physical. So he accepts there are such things as what it's like to be Tom, what it's like to experience red, what it's like to have pain, etc. He thinks all these things are real and he thinks they're not physical. What's more, he also thinks that the mental is caused by the physical. So it's your... your um, God, I can't think of a single case of physico-psycho causation. Come on, help me. The physical world causing a mental state. Why are you burning your fingers? Yes, OK. Um, I put my hand on a hot plate and I feel pain, or I see the, the traffic light change and experience red. OK, so that's all right. The epiphenomenalist thinks that's fine. Physical states cause mental states. But um, 
we've seen that the problem for the idea of physico-psycho-causal interaction is if mental states aren't physical, then how can mental states cause physical things? Answer, says the epiphenomenalist, they don't. Mental states cause nothing. They simply, they're causally inert. They don't even enter into the causal um, nexus, except in, in virtue of the fact that they are themselves caused by physical states. So mental states are causally inert. They are the upshot of, co of complex physical systems. Um, they're undetectable by anything other than introspection because they make no difference at all to the physical world. Now, going back to where we were before, do you remember, we looked at dualism, and the problem with dualism is that if mental states are not physical, then how can they causally interact with the physical world? Um, we looked at uh, anomalous monism, and we looked at the causal exclusion argument, which says if mental states are not physical, how can they interact with the causal world? Well, the epiphenomenalist just says they can't. End of story. It's not a problem. As long as we accept that mental states are epiphenomenal, we can still accept that they're real, and, and it's not a problem that they don't interact with mental state, uh, with physical states. Um, there is a big question here, why shouldn't mental states cause other mental states? But I'm going to ignore that, because epiphenomenalists do say that mental states are causally inert, and I don't quite see why they can't cause other mental states, but anyway. Here are three objections to the epiphenomenalist claim, and we're going to look at three uh, responses to these objections in a moment. Surely, we might say... Ah, oh, there's a question. OK, is it going to be fairly quick? Well, just uh, fairly quick. <coughs> I wanted to... Uh, I was interested in, in the arguments that you put for the but it didn't seem to me that, although I agreed with those arguments about the Mary and knowing everything we want to know about the visual system but not experiencing this and that, but I mean, this essentially seems to me to be a difference between a third-person description and a first-person experience. And you don't have to be an epiphenomenalist to take that line of argument. Well, but, but surely... But Remember, the epiphenomenalist thinks that mental states make no difference to anything other than introspection. Therefore, the only way you can discover about mental states is by the first-person perspective. So, so you can't... If you're an epiphenomenalist, you, you rely on introspection, the first-person perspective, to say that mental states exist. But, but surely anyone who takes consciousness seriously recognises that there's something very special about consciousness and that that subjective experience isn't the same as or can't be exactly deduced from a, a third person description. Well, and the epiphenomenalist takes consciousness very seriously indeed. They believe that mental states exist and that the only way you can get to them is by the first person experience through introspection. Um, and that's why they make the arguments they make. I'm not going to take any other questions at the moment. Don't forget we have a whole session of questions tomorrow, so save up your questions. Um, OK, I'm going to make three objections to the epiphenomenalist claim. The first one is, how can you say that mental states are causally inefficacious? That's ridiculous. Why am I doing what I'm doing here now? It's because I like teaching and I believe that coming to Ruley House <laughs> and doing what I'm doing is enabling me to teach somebody about philosophy. Um, that's what I want. That's what I believe. That's what I intend to do. That's why I'm here. How can you tell me that I'm not doing what I'm doing because I believe what I believe and I want what I want and so on? It's ridiculous. Um, OK, that's the first objection. Um, second objection is, if qualia have evolved, and I, I found it very difficult to persuade any of you, I think, maybe some of you, but most of you, um, 
refused to accept when I put an argument forward earlier for the non-existence of qualia, you refused to go along with me, okay? You all think qualia exist. Well, if you think that qualia exists, you'll probably think that they've evolved um, and that if they've evolved, they, they must be adaptive because how can anything evolve if it's not adaptive to the environment? And the, the whole mechanism of evolution is that you get a mutation that's um, adaptive for some reason within the environment and the things that have that mutation survive and flourish and pass on that mutation until eventually all the people in uh, the people things in that species have that mutation um, that's what it is to evolve how can it be adaptive without being causally efficacious okay third argument um, we looked earlier at functionalism, which says that um, mental states are theoretical states. Um, a mental state is the state it is because of the function it plays within our folk psychological theory. Um, so we look at the uh, environmental stimuli that cause these states and we look at the behavioural output of these states and we say, ah, oh, so-and-so is feeling pain. Janet is in pain. I just kicked her and caused tissue damage, and she went, ah, um, therefore she's in pain. How can that, how can her behaviour provide me with any evidence for the fact she's in pain, for her having a state with a certain quality, or qualia, if her states are not causally implicated in the production of her behaviour? I mean, the idea that mental states are causally inert is just surely rubbish. OK, let's have a look at the responses to this argument now. Actually, let's see if any of you can come up with responses to these responses. So, OK, we've got this claim. Mental states are causally inefficacious. They're causally inert. They do nothing. These are three objections to them. Can you come back on these objections and say why they're not objections? On the third one, I think. Go on. Because if you, if you kick the lady and she has been out in pain, um, you can infer that she's got qualia, but you don't know it. Just as you can only infer that she's a, uh, a thinking person like yourself. It's true that um, there is a, um, a gap if you like. Um, I, I can't experience Janet's qualia for myself, but I do, I, my theory, my whole theory of Janet's behaviour is that when she acts as if she's in pain, and when she tells me she's in pain, <laughs> it's because she's in pain. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not actually uh, a, phys a mental state, <coughs> it's a physical state. Uh, I kick someone, uh, when I kick, I touch the, uh, the leg of someone else, and then there is uh, some, I don't know, the body. There's a physical the response. Stimulus. There is a physical response which uh, provokes another physical response, and this is why I, um, I act. And I do not act to pain, but I act to the physical OK, I think we might look at those. OK, let's look at the answers to these, one of which I think might be the one that you're giving. OK, so the first one was, surely we do what we do because we believe what we believe and feel what we feel. Um, well, how do we know that our actions and our mental states aren't both the effect of some common cause? So if um, here's your behaviour, your owl... Okay, here's your mental state, your pain. Um, here's a physical state, let's call it C-fiber firing. I mean, I guess, why not? Okay, why don't we think that that causes both these things, which means that there's a correlation between these things, which falsely causes us to believe that pain causes pain behaviour. And pain, is that what you meant? Yep, pain experiences. Do you see what I mean? The pain could be caused by the C-fiber fire just, just as the owl is caused. 
our only reason for thinking that pain behaviour and pain experiences are caused by pain is because that there's a correlation, isn't there, between feeling pain and saying, ow. Um, so it causes us... To, but actually, we all know about causation, that if C fibre firing were to cause both these things, these things would be correlated in a way that would give us evidence for thinking that there's a causal relation. So the idea that we think that our pain causes pain behaviour, well, we would, wouldn't we, if they were both the common cause, sorry, both the cause of some common third thing. OK, let's look at the second one. If qualia have evolved, then they must be adaptive. And how can they be adaptive without being causally efficacious? Well, actually, quite easily. Um, properties can evolve as byproducts of something that is adaptive, without themselves being adaptive. So the heavy coat of the polar bear is not adaptive. Heavy coats are actually not a good thing to have if you live in somewhere where it's cold and you're swimming a lot, are they? Heavy coats are a bad thing. But thick coats are adaptive, and you can't have a thick coat that isn't a heavy coat. Do you see that thick coats have evolved because they help protect you from the cold? And heavy coats have come along with thick coats, but heavy coats are not adaptive. They haven't evolved themselves, or rather they have evolved, but only as a byproduct. They're not themselves adaptive. In exactly the same way, perhaps mental properties have evolved as a byproduct of something that is adaptive, C fibre firing, perhaps without themselves being adaptive, because how could they be adaptive if they're not causally efficacious? But the fact that you can happily say they've evolved without insisting that they must be causally efficacious. OK, let's look at the third one. How can behaviour provide us with evidence for qualia if qualia are not causally implicated in the production of behaviour? Do you remember I said if I kick Janet and she screams, how, why do I think that her behaviour is evidence for her pain if her pain didn't cause her behaviour? Well, if qualia and behaviour are correlated in this way, this would explain this one too. I mean, in the same way, my reading in the Times that Spurs won, this is not my example, by the way. You, you, <laughs> I don't, I'm not even sure who Spurs are, except I suspect it's something to do with football. OK, my reading in the Times that Spurs won is evidence for believing that the Telegraph is also going to report that Spurs won, but not because the Times caused to write what it did by the Telegraph's writing what it did, at least we hope not. Um, OK, so Spurs winning caused both the Times and the Telegraph to report that Spurs won, and for that reason, my seeing that the Times reported that, the tele that Spurs won gives me evidence to think that the Telegraph would also report it. And exactly the same way, um, my, uh, in taking that as evidence for that, that would be perfectly well explained by the fact that that is evidence for both that and that. So Spurs winning causes both the Times and the Telegraph to write that, the that Spurs won, with the result that seeing that the Times <coughs> writes that Spurs won gives me evidence to think that the Telegraph would write that Spurs won. See? So actually, the arguments for epiphenomenalism are perhaps a little better than you might think they are. Um, nevertheless, I, I completely understand that um, epiphenomenalism is hugely counterintuitive. Um, for one thing, if mental states really are causally inert, then do we really need to admit them into our ontologies at all? And actually, you might want to say now, well, of course I do. I, can, I feel it. I look at Susie's jacket and I think I experience red. My experience of redness is, is something... 
I, I see introspectively, I can't deny it. Actually, Bertrand Russell had the, the, he really wanted to be a behaviorist. And he said, but I can't convince myself that qualia can't, don't exist. Therefore, behaviorism must be wrong. Well, I hope I convinced you a little bit at least earlier that actually, if your C fibers firing cause you to believe you're in pain, you don't need a qualia at all. I think. Um, anyway, why do we need these things if they're causally inefficacious? We think we see them introspectively, but there are actually good arguments that explain why we think that and are thinking that is false. Okay, so why don't we just accept epiphenomenalism? But if you don't like that, if you think that it's better to eliminate them, let's look at the next view, epiphenomenalism. But before we do, does anyone want to ask any questions about epiphenomenalism? Sorry, the next view we're going to look at is eliminativism, not epiphenomenalism. It's amazing I can do this after two glasses of wine, isn't it? Can I just take up your argument that you were making about the reason that you teach philosophy <laughs> is because you feel good about philosophy? I, I don't think you know. I say quite that. Well, I, I, I might like to suggest that teaching philosophy makes you feel good. That too. So I, I don't see why the first should apply. Uh, I don't think it really matters because I was using that as an example to say surely it's obvious that I do what I do because I believe what I believe. But the um, feeling good then it, 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 it well, maybe isn't, I teach, isn't causing you to teach philosophy. It's no, my belief be teaching that teaching philosophy. philosophy will make me feel good is what causes me to teach philosophy. I mean, why it makes me feel good is, is open to question. But the thought is that it's because I believe that teaching philosophy will make me feel good that I do it. I want to teach philosophy because I believe it'll make me feel good. But, but as we've seen, actually, the question is, is it really the case that I do what I do because I believe what I believe? The epiphenomenalists say no. I'm sorry, I do not understand the essence of the argument. I am crazy. This is a state of mind, isn't it? Being crazy. I am mad. I am completely out. Okay. I commit suicide. You commit suicide. So that's I the have end. a mental, mental state, state, and then I, there is a physical state. There is a body. <laughs> Isn't it cause and effect? Um, so what you're saying is that you believe your belief that you would be better off dead yes. causes you to commit suicide. Exactly. Okay. So a mental state is causally efficacious. Okay. What the epiphenomenalists would say is you just think that, well, sorry, you don't think at all at this point, but the rest of us think, I've forgotten your name. Eleanor. Eleanor. Um, oh, poor Eleanor, she's dead. Um, that was because she wanted to die. She believed she'd be better off dead. But actually, why couldn't it be a case of this? There's um, a, a physical state here that caused you both to believe that you'd be better off dead and to kill yourself. So from your point of view, you thought it was that causing that, yeah. but as a matter of fact, that was causing both that and that. Mm. So what caused you to kill yourself was this physical state here, uh -huh. and at the same time, this physical state caused your belief that you'd be better off dead. And you saw that correlation. Of course, that's completely invisible to you introspectively. That's all you see introspectively. You don't see that. So if there is a malfunction in my brain. No, well, it's not a malfunction. There a no, there's no malfunction. Epi Epiphenomenalism thinks that this is how the mental works. It's no malfunction. It's a chemical or something. Yeah, yeah so there, there is. is but you're right. It must be fine. Well, may, uh, the fact is, that if, if you're thinking that any state that caused you to commit suicide is a malfunction, then that's the malfunction, not yes, that one. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's that that's the malfunction. Okay. But your yeah. third, your third circle down there on the bottom left that you say is the hidden cause of the other two reflects, doesn't have much weight, as indeed 
God, for instance, doesn't have much weight until you actually show what that is. Well, um, epiphenomenalists would say that um, all you need to do, I mean, all you need to find, and actually I was reading about this in Scientific American Mind last week, and so if I could remember what it actually said, which I can't, um, there is apparently a, a neural state that correlates with committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Um, it also happens to cause feelings of depression. So, I mean, you might say that science has already shown that there is this which causes that and that. Um, but, of course, we all know that that's not true because of identity theory and Kripke and so on. You have to show that in every case. Well, yes, but, but uh, can't we extrapolate from the logical compellingness of this case. I mean, you think that, our mental, that your mental states cause you to act. I've just given you another explanation of why you think that, which fits very nicely with the fact that um, dualism has the problem that it can't explain how mental states cause physical states. Physicalism has the problem that it can't explain how mental states cause physical states. Epiphenomenalist says, well, no surprise that it can't, because actually mental states don't cause physical states. How do physical states cause mental states? Isn't that just those big problems the other way? It's, it's just epiphenomenal. It's mm -hmm. the upshot of. I mean, how do things cause shadows? They get in the way of light. Um, it's, it's not a... I mean, that is another question. Um, but we don't have to answer that question to, to accept what's going on here. OK, let, let's move on. Um, we're now going to look at eliminativism. Eliminativism believes that mental states aren't real at all. So, so far, all this, the um, theories of mind that we've looked at have accepted that mental states are real. So dualism thinks that mental states are real and they're different from physical states. Identity theory thinks that mental states are real and they're identical to physical states. You, they're real, you can reduce them to physical states, but they're still real. Functionalism thinks they're real, albeit reducible to functional states. Anomalous monism thinks they're real, and what's more, they're sui generis, they're real in their own right. Epiphenomenalists think they're real, just causally effic inefficacious. Eliminativists don't think they're real. There are no physical uh, mental states. OK, so like the functionalist, the eliminativist believes that mental states are theoretical states, states drawn from folk psychology. Do you remember um, what I said about theoretical states? A theoretical state is a state of a theory. You, you've got something you want explained, something you can observe, something you can point to, see, etc., and you postulate something unobservable in explanation of this observable thing, and you call that thing the Higgs boson, or whatever you call it. You, you give it a name, because it's that state that plays that role. Now, the functionalists believe that, but so do the eliminativists. Um, and the theory from which mental states are drawn is folk psychological theory. So why did Janet leap up when I kicked her? Answer, because she was in pain. She experienced pain. Um, why did uh, Penny cross the road? Answer, she wanted an ice cream and believed that she could buy one from the ice cream van. So there, there's this theory, folk psychological theory, from which I derive mental states, and I therefore postulate the theory looks at, it works. Theory is a good theory. I can, ex I can in make intelligible Jane's behavior. I make intelligible Janet's behavior, etc. cetera. Um, let's postulate that it's true. There are mental states, and they act in this way. But whereas the functionalist thinks that folk, psychologically, folk psychology is a true theory, a limitivist thinks that folk psychology is a false theory. Um, 
according to the eliminativist, folk psychology should be eliminated along with all its other the uh, its theoretical states, just like other false theories with their theoretical states. I've forgotten what I'm about to say. Okay. I wasn't, I was going to ad lib from here on in. Okay, until the next slide. This will do. Okay, why is folk psychology a false theory? Why, why should we reject it? Um, okay, wood lice. You know, wood lice, nasty little things you find in the garden all the time in your plant pots. Um, why are they always found un under rocks, under logs, things like that? Answer, they like the damp, okay? And they believe that that's where the damp is to be found. So whenever you see them, they're scuttling away to find themselves a damp place. So that's what they like. Well, actually, this is not at all what wood lice do. Wood lice embody a mechanism called a kinesis, I think, um, which means that um, as the air around them gets drier, they move, and they move in whatever direction they happen to be pointed, um, and they move at a speed determined by how dry the air is around them. And as the air gets damper, they slow down, and as it gets damp enough, they stop. That's why wood lice are found under rocks and logs and things like that. And the minute you know that, you, you no longer think that they like the damp and believe that it's damp under rocks and things like that. You don't need all the panoply of belief, desire, explanation once you've learnt about these kinesis. Dead easy. Um, and we use Occam's razor. Somebody was taking me to task for Occam's razor. We use Occam's razor to get rid of the theory it was Eucharist to get rid of the theory that attributes wood lice beliefs and desires and intentions and so on because actually all we need to do is attribute them a kinesis and, and we've got what we want which is an explanation of why they always end up under logs and things and so here we've got a case where science has shown us that we don't need to postulate beliefs and desires to explain any wood louse behavior once you learn that all wood louse behaviour can be explained in terms of kinesis, taxis, fixed action patterns, that sort of thing, you, d you don't need belief, does, desires, you don't need a theory of mind to explain wood louse behaviour. Okay, now, in the beginning, in the beginning, everything was explained by appeal to reasons and causes were a very small so mountains exploded because they were angry and you had to make sacrifices of beautiful maidens and plump young children and things like that in order to stop the mountain getting angry so it wouldn't explode rivers wanted to get to the sea um, aristotle believed that the reason stones fell to the ground when you dropped them is because they wanted to get to their natural place which was the center of the earth why did fire rise because the natural place of fire where it wanted to go was up into the air so all these explanations were reason explanations, attributing beliefs, desires, etc., to mountains, streams, trees, etc., etc. Uh, we didn't know many causal explanations, so we didn't use them. And the advance of science has been to actually turn it round completely the other way. Now, um, reason explanation is here and causal explanation is here. Do you remember we were looking at the difference between reason explanation and causal explanation before um, when we looked at um, causation is law governed and reason is charity governed? Do you remember? Um, well, actually, science has just taken over, hasn't it? It's now the reason explanations apply to us and to um, the apes, perhaps, computers, I don't know, where, wherever you want to put reason explanations. But the vast majority of things in the world can now be explained in that way rather than that way. And the eliminativists believe that this is going to march on 
until there is no reason explanation needed. Eventually, science will be able to explain all your behaviour without any appeal to beliefs, desires, <coughs> pains, etc. I will know neurophysiologically why you do what you do. And it, it may, I mean, I'll still, you, if, I, if a child says, why is the woodlouse doing that? I'll say, well, darling, the woodlouse like, likes the damp and it's going da 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 da. But uh, nobody believes that that's true. That's just what I tell a child because it's much easier to, to explain things by appeal to reasons than it is to explain things by appeal to kinesis. I see you, I'll come to you in a minute. So um, what the eliminativist thinks is that reason explanations did, um, in the, they did for mountains and things like that until we found the proper explanation. And in exactly the same way, psychological explanations of our behavior will do until we know what the real explanations are. And the real explanations are going to be physical explanations, neurophysiological explanations, and reason explanations will just drop out. They, they won't have any um, role left at all. So, like the functionalist, the eliminativist believes that mental states... Are, we've done this. Hang on. Okay, so they think it's a false theory. And just as magic is going to be eliminated, well, was, is eliminate, uh, eliminated, so folk psychological theories are going to be eliminated once neuroscience gets its act together and enables us to explain all the things that we want to explain without any appeal to mental states, etc. Let me just see. Okay, what were you going to say? You've just eliminated free will, haven't you? Oh, certainly. If you're an eliminativist, you're also a hard determinist. Um, and the difference here is the... Um, the hard determinist uh, believes that everything we do is caused. All our behaviour is caused by the initial conditions, the conditions surrounding us, and the laws of nature. So the initial conditions include what's going on in my brain, etc., and the laws of nature and what's going on in my environment produce my behaviour. I don't make any choices at all. Soft determinist thinks that um, causal determination is consistent with free will, which is logically difficult because if you get one action, a token action, how can it be both determined and free? That's the problem for the soft determinist. And then there's the libertarian who believes that we have free will. And the eliminativist is fairly and squarely here. The hard determinist believes there's no such thing as truth. How could there be truth? Because if there aren't any beliefs, there isn't any truth. The only things that are true are either beliefs or the sentences that express beliefs. Well, if there aren't any beliefs, sentences express nothing. Okay, there are no meanings because there are no belief contents to express. There is no truth either. Um, nor is there any free will. This is what the world is like. I don't look so worried because the fact is, if the eliminativist, if the hard determinist is right, they're already right. It's already the case. And now, this is not something that's going to come upon us. It is already upon us. Um, if hard determinism is true, that's what the world is like now. We are under an illusion. Not only that we, that we have free will, but that we have beliefs, desires, that there is any meaning, any content, any truth. I mean, it's a pretty bleak world. But if we live in that bleak world, we're already in it. Maybe that's why there's so quality. We, well, our belief, our false beliefs in qualia. But if we're in that world, we can't believe we're in it. 
it's, it's certainly true that if we're in it, we can't... <laughs> and if we're in this world, if we're eliminativists, I mean, you might think, how could we believe that we don't have beliefs? Mm. Mm. I, I can follow all this. I, I can agree with Harvard. Oh, oh, I'm so glad. I, I, I mean, that, that's no problem. I, mean, I, can, I can see that one day the whole of folk psychology will be discredited. But it, it, what it's, dis, it's being discredited is the causal relationship between mental states and nils. No, between fit, there aren't any mental well, states. No, that, that's one thing it can't discredit because there, I have mental states. I'm telling you. I mean, that's just. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> You are going on introspective evidence that... I'm perfectly happy to agree that my ang when I feel angry, it doesn't actually have any cause and effect. That sense, there's just a parallel effect as the same cause. But I'm, I'm not... I can tell you that I, am, that I can get angry. I'm not angry. No, you can tell me that you believe that you get angry, or at least that you believe that you believe that you can get angry. <laughs> but if the eliminativists are right, you are wrong. And when she comes out of her room and suddenly thinks she's got knowledge, she's wrong. Because what happens is she enters into the same illusions that the rest of us are under. But an illusion is an experience. Yes. Being deceived is an experience. So, do the eliminatives know that they exist? <laughs> well, presumably not, <laughs> because they don't know anything. I mean, they don't have beliefs. I mean, it's, um, it's very easy to poke fun at the eliminativists, but actually, unless we're going to say, um, OK, they are using an inductive argument. Up till now, causal explanation has taken over from reason explanation in every sphere we've looked at, and that's true. That really is true. Um, what they're saying is it will take over everywhere. Now, you might disagree with it, that you might say, no, there's some principled reason why reason explanation um, is the only explanation that will ever work for us. But if you believe that, you've got to come up with some reason for thinking that that's true. And actually, they're, they're thinking, well, hang on a second, they're using the causal exclusion argument to say, why do you think that mental states cause anything? Even the epiphenomenists accept that causal states don't explain anything. Tell me, they say, why do you want to even believe in mental states? This introspective evidence of yours, um, we dealt with that, didn't we, before, when we talked about functionalism? You think you have experiences of red, but actually we can delete those with beliefs. Well, that's, a, that's an experience of belief. A belief so isn't an experience. Point, I can see the point is the very beginning bit, where if we're doubting, then we must have a mind, a mental state of doubting. Mm. If you're doubting. That sort of transcendental argument is only good if you, if you believe the antecedent. Which is? If you're doubting. I mean, if you're not doubting, then well, you have no I'm reason. You I'm think doubting. you're doubting. <laughs> no, you think you're doubting, and actually you believe that you think you're doubting. But what if that belief is false? But isn't the awareness of your own existence the most I'm real playing with you now. But is it, do you see how easy it is to play with you? Um, you can go on forever. But, but what you can't do, what we don't want to do, is go on forever, because actually the eliminativists, eliminativists have a better argument than, than we might think. And in order to engage with them, we cannot just say, it's obvious I have thoughts, because actually they've dealt with that. Sorry, somebody else has to have a go. I'm happy with eliminativism. You're happy with eliminativism? Just a second. Up to the point that I cannot disprove that, because I cannot accept a theory that I cannot disprove. There isn't any point. I mean, it's always it always goes beyond that. How do I know that I know? It's like a, a psychologist that talk about the subconscious. But this isn't a sceptical argument. It's I, I can never say that it will never stop, because I cannot prove that it won't stop, and that point will never come. 
so there is no evidence that in the end I can say one way or the other. It either exists or it doesn't. Well, no, I, I, I disagree with you. I disagree with you because I think there is a way that you can get back to the eliminativists. And for that, you'll have to look at some other lectures of mine because I'm not going to go into it now. But I, the thing is, you, um, the eliminativists have a much better argument than might appear on the surface. I mean, the idea that we couldn't possibly believe that we don't have beliefs. Well, yes. I mean, they believe that you don't have beliefs. We, we can, th this is not a, actually a logical contradiction. So how can um, I prove that I do have beliefs? I cannot prove that. Um, well, you certainly, can't, you certainly can't prove it if it's false. And that's what they're claiming. Listen, there are arguments here you can engage with. There really are. And I've given the outline of the arguments and you've got the <laughs> handouts. And there's nothing I can do now to convince you of the truth of any of these things that I'm putting to you. In fact, I'm doing my very best to one minute convince you of the truth and the next minute convince you that they're false. And what I'm hoping to do, and then that they might be true again. Um, because what I'm hoping to do is loosen any dogmatic views. I'm obviously failing in that. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to loosen any dogmatic views you might have on this, because actually, this is really cutting edge stuff. This, this is, what is the mind? We all think we have beliefs. We all think we have experiences. But, but there are very good out, arguments out there to suggest either that we don't, or that we do and they're not what we think they are, or that we do and that they are what, they th what we think they are, but there are big problems with this and how are we going to square this with our other theories, like physics, for example, or neurophysiology, both of which are theories on the whole we probably don't want to junk. Um, so we'd like our theory of mind to square with them. Do, do you see what I mean? Th this is stuff to think about. It's not stuff that you can do in even six hours. <laughs> uh, was that a question or were you just holding your hand up? Um, is it a fairly quick one, David? Yes, I was wondering, as we've established why the kinesis with the woodlouse, when do we understand what the kinesis is that's brought us all here this week? Well, yes, indeed. I, maybe you were just moving towards the light. <laughs> um, or that might be just me. <laughs> Uh, or the warmth. Maybe it was all cold in your house. OK, let's move on. Um, we've done this, haven't we? Um, OK, if with the epiphenomenalists we believe that mental states are causally inert, then we've got to accept that folk psychology is a false theory, haven't we? Because folk psychology tells us that mental states are what cause our behaviour that our behaviours, our actions at least, are such that there is causally, um, causally implicated in them beliefs, desires, intentions, etc. Um, so there's at least something false about folk psychology if we go along with the epiphenomenalists. Um, um, that we do eliminate theories that turn out to be wrong, I should have put false there, is also true. You can see why I didn't. Um, oh, I've done that. OK, so the eliminate, which we remember. Did-ah, did-ah, did-ah. OK, you understand all that? I've said all that already, just in a different order. OK. Um, OK, and I've said that too. Uh, the inductive argument, the whole history of science, they say, um, and they're right, has been a process of eliminating folk psychological explanation. Uh, and they believe that science is going to continue to do that. So do you remember I talked about the principle of the uniformity of nature, the idea that the future will be like the past? So if you've if every time you've seen A, it's been correlated with B, the next time you see A, it'll be correlated with B. Well, if every time you've ever had a reason explanation, it's eventually been replaced with a causal explanation, surely you believe that the next time you come across a reason explanation that you believe can't be replaced by a causal explanation, it will be. You'll be wrong. 
Um, so that's the inductive argument. Um, <coughs> yes. <laughs> okay, when you complain to an eliminativist, uh, eliminativist, but hang on, I've got beliefs, I've got desires, and I, I can't see that we're going to go away from this. I like to have... Um, they'd say you're a sentimental old softy. I, I do a little thought experiment occasionally, and on the online course I do this, so those of you who've done the online course in mind will know this. Um, at birth, this, everyone's skull is, is removed, the top of their skull is removed, and a perspex um, top is put on, so you can see exactly what neural states are going. And, and at school, we're all taught the laws, the causal laws that explain our behaviour. So actually... I can explain Mary, is that right? All Mary's behaviour by looking at the top of her head. I don't actually have to lock eyes with her at all. Um, I don't have to engage in interpretation. I don't have to use the principle of charity. I don't have to think, well, that's interesting. Mary believes P and I don't. Why does she believe P? Tell me. And I look into her eyes and ask her to... Uh, OK, all I have to do is look at, into her skull. Um, but lovers... Um, they actually like the old-fashioned way of doing it, you know. So when you fall in love, you buy a woolly hat <laughs> <laughs> and you pull it on over your perspex dome so that the only way you can interpret each other is by looking into each other's eyes and, and saying, what do you think, darling? <laughs> and so the other can tell you rather than you just looking at their... Anyway, you can see the... <coughs> So you might want to just be a, a sentimental old softy and keep your woolly hat on, um, but you don't need to. OK, from the arguments we've examined, it seems very difficult to show that mental is scientifically respectable, by which I mean physical. Um, but most people would have trouble with the idea of eliminating the mental, even if it is scientifically redundant. Um, and the only... Alternative is there is something, the mental, that's real, but simply not visible, even in principle, to science. So if we go back to dualism of some kind um, and say that actually science is never going to be able to see mental states because mental states are not the sort of things that can be seen by science, um, but then we're back into dualist territory, and for all the reasons we've already looked at, we may not want to be there. Those are the references for tonight. And tomorrow, what we're going to look at is um, whether we've got the wrong questions. Because we're not getting any answers, are we? <laughs> all we're doing is getting ourselves and more and more and more into a difficult situation. None of these theories seem right, do they? And if everything you looked at is such that it doesn't seem right, you have to ask yourself, are you asking the wrong question? And tomorrow we'll ask ourselves that, and maybe we'll come up with the idea that we are asking the wrong question.